Good morning. Good morning. morning. Now, JP thinks that I'm here to talk about leadership. I'm really here to start the draft JP for president movement. I mean, listen, if Donald Trump can do it, I'm just saying. This is a newspaper. Those of you under 25 have never seen this before. <laughs> it was this morning's paper here locally. Below the fold, Metro changes under new leadership. Not new management, not new supervisors, new leadership. We are going to talk about leadership today, not management. Management is the hot dog story, where the son, having gone to the most prominent schools in America, tells dad how to make a hot dog more efficiently, how to save a little bit of money, how to get a few more out. That's not what we're here about. Managers make the trains run faster. Leaders invent the airplane and the internet. What is leadership? How do you become a leader? Are leaders born or made? Now, the answers to these questions are incredibly important because organizations like yours need leaders, particularly in challenging times. And by the way, what times are not challenging? A leader articulates a vision. Hopefully, that is oriented towards solving a problem, a big problem, usually, but it can be small, and then motivates the team to accomplish that mission through empowering you to do more than you could do on your own, emboldening others around you to step outside of their comfort zone, persuading you to go where you otherwise would not go on your own. That's the key to leadership. Now, there may not be a standard definition to leadership. And some people believe that leaders are born and that their parents just didn't do a very good job at it. Obviously, JP did a pretty good job at that. And the problem with that worldview is if you think leaders are born, not made, then there's really no incentive for me to try to become a better leader, for me to practice certain skills and disciplines that take me along the leadership continuum. And that's what it is. Leadership is not a binary equation where you're either not a leader or you're a leader. It is you're an OK leader. We want to take you to being a great leader. Over the next half hour or so, I'm going to try to visit with you about some practices and concepts that you can use in your business to move along the leadership continuum. Now, some really smart people, including a former US Supreme Court justice, say when it comes to things like beauty, leadership, fame, well, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. Justice Potter Stewart, in a famous case in 1964, dealing with the issue of whether a film had an obscene section. After reviewing the film, I'm guessing many times, <laughs> Justice Stewart concluded, I can't define obscenity, but I know it when I see it. And it may be that leadership is a little bit like that. I want you to imagine with me, in fact, you could close your eyes if you want to, that it's 1963. It's the summer, and we're on the Mall in Washington. And in front of the Lincoln Memorial, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King 
is giving his famous I have a dream speech. And he says, I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed, that all men are created equal. I have a dream that the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will one day sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day in this nation, my four little children will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. Is there any doubt that you're in the presence of a leader? You know it when you see it. But we want to make all of you leaders. Leadership's important because leaders inspire, motivate, persuade. They get us to do what we would not otherwise do. How many of you would get up and work out in the morning on your own? Well, maybe a few, but not a lot of us. We need coaches. Even professional athletes need coaches to become the best that they can be. Leaders move organizations forward. They overcome resistance to change. They take us to a higher plane, and they articulate a vision. In fact, leadership author John Cotter says, Leaders provide a vision, a picture of the future, with some commentary on why we would strive to create that future. A good vision helps to overcome resistance to what is probably going to be a painful process. By acknowledging that sacrifices will be required, there will be some short-term pain but a leader makes clear that those sacrifices will yield benefits today and tomorrow that take us to a place that is superior to where we are today. You see, a leader looks around the corner, peers into the future, and realizes, kind of like the people in the newspaper business, we're on unsteady ground. It's a little bit shaky. In the future, I may get my news from this, where I also get all my phone calls, my calendars, my texts, Facebook, and everything else that I need. By the way, you can follow me on Twitter at, at SmithermanTX. <laughs> this is what good leadership is about. Now, I like to go to the movie. Who in here likes to see film? Everybody, right? One of my favorite movies is the Lord of the Rings trilogy. The third one, as a matter of fact, The Return of the King. And if you'll remember toward the end, when Sam and Frodo are trying to get to Mount Doom to drop the ring in, and by the way, that scene takes forever. <laughs> as they crawl up, fall down, crawl up, fall down, I fast forward to get to the part in front of Black Gate, where Aragon and Legolas and Gimli and Gandalf know that they are on a mission that is bound to fail. But they're trying to buy some time for Sam and Frodo. Black Gate opens up and out walks hundreds of thousands of orcs. Trolls. By the way, trolls are just unfair, OK? There's no way you should have to go up against something that weighs about, I don't know, 5,000 pounds. And the men are getting really nervous. If you remember that scene, Aragon, so beautiful, he says, hold your ground. Hold your ground, men of Gondor and Rohan, my brothers, my brothers. I see in your eye the same fear that would take the heart of me. And there may come a time when the courage of men fails, and we forsake our friends and break all bonds of fellowship. But it is not this day. A day of woe and shattered shield when the age of man comes crashing down. But it is not this day. This day we fight. 
By all that you hold dear on this good earth, I ask you stand with me, men of the West. You're not going anywhere, are you? <laughs> You're standing. Against insurmountable odds, you're standing. Now, this should lead us to answer the next question. What goals are worthy of leaders? No, really, this is interactive. What goals are ready? <laughs> Anyone? You remember the movie? Ferris Bueller's Day Off, right? Anyone, anyone, Bueller, anyone? Shout out. What goals are worthy of leaders? I, I heard fame. Fame, I want to live forever. Notoriety, right? Does there, is there anybody who would like a companion? A date. That's a worthy goal depending on where you are in life. <laughs> okay, this is the business revolution. More business, right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> More money. Show me the money. Well, maybe not so much that last one. We're not really here to separate our customers from their wallets. That's not really what it's all about. It is about pursuing a cluster of objectives and, glow, and goals. Not all of them, as a matter of fact, are all about making money. This is an old film, but one of my favorite ones, called Glenn Carey, Glenn, Glenn Ross. Anybody seen this? Yeah, of course, if you're in the sales business, you have to know this movie. Right, a young Alec Baldwin walks out to a suburban real estate sales office with a bunch of not very good salesmen. It's a rainy night. He's been sent from the guys downtown to shape these salesmen up. In fact, we used this when I was running for both my offices, one successfully, one not so much. Not everything you do, you hit the mark the first time. Baldwin walks in, he says, so you want to sell real estate? It's a tough racket. Are you man enough to sell real estate? Ooh. As you know, we have a new sales contest this month. First prize is an Eldorado Cadillac. Second prize is a set of steak knives. Third prize, you're fired. <laughs> oh. Do I have your attention now? <laughs> Do you get me? A, B, C. A, always B, B, C, closing. Always be closing. Always be closing. You must get them to sign on the line that is dotted. That's all they care about in this particular scene. You have money. I want it. But that's not really what we're all about here. It's not just about signing on the dotted line. In fact, a lot of leadership authors have taken a look at this particular frame of mind. In fact, a couple of guys, Jerry Porras and James Collins, in their legendary book, Built to Last, they say, JP said it earlier. Myth. The most successful companies exist first and foremost to maximize profit. Reality. Contrary to business school doctrine, maximizing shareholder wealth or profit has not been the dominant driving force or primary objective throughout the history of American business, particularly if you look at great companies like Disney, Apple, Nordstrom's, Paul Mitchell. Yes, they pursue profit, but only as a cluster of objectives and not necessarily the primary one. 
Paradoxically, visionary companies make more money than their non-visionary counterparties. That's the riddle. I'm in business to do good, to make you beautiful and happy. And along the way, I make more money than the shop down the street. Visionary leaders seek to achieve the impossible. Da, 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 da. I wanted to get the tape, but I'd had to pay some royalty rights, so. <laughs> this is what we're about. When we think about great leadership, we think about achieving the impossible, or what at the time was believed to be impossible. Here's some examples from government and history of people who achieved the impossible. Nelson Mandela, first black president of South Africa. Winston Churchill stood alone in the battle against Nazi Germany before the Americans joined. Ronald Reagan took on the Soviet Union, which is no more. Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier, the first person of color to be in the major leagues. Walt Disney brought us what we now know as wonderful theme parks, Pixar Entertainment. Steve Jobs, by the way, there's a film coming out on Jobs later in the year. Imagine back in the day, personal computers, big, clunky, unfriendly, hard to deal with. Now we have this. It's all we need. It's everything right here. From the streets of LA selling hair care product door to door, well, we know John Paul's story. That is what impossible leadership is all about. So who wants to be a leader? Right, everybody. Exactly. How do you become a leader? Or a better leader than you are today? And how do you get you and your organization to achieve impossible goals? Now, there are probably as many paths to leadership as there are leadership speakers and leadership authors. I'm going to share with you one that has worked for me and many of the things that JP and Michael Ling talked about earlier are embedded in my comments. One, perform an early miracle. This could be an early success. Fix a broken copy machine. Espresso maker, curling iron, anything that's not working and has not been working for a while in the store, take it upon yourself to fix it. In fact, one leadership author says, a hallmark of leadership is the willingness to take action when others hesitate. Take action. Do something. Fix something, even if it's not your responsibility. Treat everyone with dignity and respect, always, for a variety of reasons, one of which is when you first become a leader or when you're given some responsibility in the salon, most people will automatically think that you're a jerk. Do everything in your power to dispel that. Go out of your way to be nice, principled, dignified. Handling employees like John Paul suggested is perfect because you're not embarrassing anyone. Be a servant. Be a servant. JP didn't say this this morning, but I've heard him say it on many occasions. Do the jobs that others don't want to do. Sweep up the hair. Organize the display. Step up and do someone else's job if they're not there. If they have to leave because of a sick child and go home. Be a servant. Legendary football coach Tom Osborne at the University of Nebraska. Anybody from Nebraska here? Yeah. We got some corn huskers. An amazing man. Wins three national championships. He coaches for 25 years. His success ratio is 0.833, 255 wins, 49 losses. 
Someone asked him, how did you achieve all this great success? He said, be a servant. When one player demonstrates their willingness to sacrifice personal goals for team goals, the attitude spreads. And once it has spread to every member of the team, no one can beat us. Be a servant. Communicate effectively. Stephen Covey, who wrote the landmark book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, says this. And his entire book says this. Communication is the most important skill in life. Let me repeat it. Communication is the most important skill in life. Think about how many relationships have been broken because of poor communication. How many countries have gone to war because of poor communication? How many customers may have you lost because of poor communication? Wouldn't it be better if at the end of a customer experience you say, look, I'm not really happy. I'm not really happy with what I did today. And I sense you may not be really happy either. I'm booked for the rest of the afternoon. If you will come back tomorrow, tell me the time and I'll fix it. We'll stick with it till you're happy. That's a heck of a lot better than that customer walking out, both of you being silent and you never seeing the customer again. Complete honesty. Complete, total honesty. When people know where you stand, they know how to make plans accordingly. But when you are not completely honest, they can't make the plans that they need. Persevere. Perhaps of all things you can do, don't quit. Winston Churchill, in 1941, went to Harrow School, right in the teeth of World War II. The Nazis were bombing the bejesus out of London. And he says, never give in. Never, never, never give in. In all things, great or small, never, never, never give in. Never yield to force, never yield to the enemy. From what it looked like to many people from the outside, our island nation was doomed. But we have only to persevere to defeat our enemy. And lastly, train your followers. You have to train up the next generation, Michaeline and Dylan, right? Remember Dylan, it may be a while for Dylan, but, <laughs> but at least Angus is planning. Anybody ever heard of a group called United We Stand America? United We Stand, not very many. That was the third party presidential effort of Ross Perot, which actually determined the outcome of the 1992 and 96 presidential races. It doesn't exist anymore because there was no plan for the next generation. Now, I want to get real practical here at the end as I'm coming to my close. If you take all of these lessons of trying to achieve impossible results, for a business, what they end up translating to is upward sloping charts. That means every year you will have performance and results metrics that are better than the year before every year, year after year after year. Now, when I took over the municipal bond department at Bank One in 1999, we weren't doing a lot of business with people we needed to be doing business with. So I said, look, we're going to increase our share of business around the country, but particularly in those parts of America where we have banks. Nobody should be getting business in our backyard. How many of you feel that way? That's your backyard. <laughs> Defend it. So over three years from 99 to 2001, we increased our league table ranking. 
I then said, look, we're not making enough money per banker. Now, that wasn't our primary goal. Let me be real clear. I said, we're going to double this in two years. So we went from 875000 to $1.75 million. When I went to the Public Utility Commission, we made a commitment in 2004 that we would increase the amount of wind energy being used in Texas 10 times. Anybody here like wind energy? Yeah. Not a bad show. Texas now leads America in the amount of wind energy produced. Yeah, all right. I love wind. We still get 80% of our energy from fossil fuel today. So when I ran for office in 2011, I said America would become energy independent led by Texas. We took oil production from 1.2 million barrels to 2.5. And then I became a politician. I like to think of myself as a reform politician today. When the governor of Texas appointed me to this position, he said, congratulations. You're now the chairman of the Railroad Commission. Go raise a million and a half dollars. Well, in six months, we raised 1.2 million. The next year, 2.5. The next year, 3.3. You can never be satisfied with what you did before. Every year has to be better than the one you just finished. Now I want to leave you with a little tool, a little metric of how to know if you're doing well between years. A year is a long time. Find your dashboard, scoreboard, speedometer, something that tells you how you're doing. I know when I bought my new car, it has a little part in the dashboard that shows me what my miles per gallon are instantaneously. I watch that thing all the time. It gives me instant feedback. So you must find yours so that it tells you whether you're leaving or not. Now, it may be number of customers through the door every day, number of customers per chair every day, Number of bottles of product every day. Number of glasses of wine that you're serving every afternoon. I don't know what it is, but you will know. And you have to come up with it yourself, and you have to use it. Now, in the investment banking world, after about six months, what I found is it was customer calls per senior banker. We began this in 2000. In January, we only had a few people buy in. By May, we were doing much better. I don't know what happened in June. Either everybody went on vacation or we lost the data. <laughs> it's always a work in progress, you know what I mean? But by the end of the year, we were making more and more customer calls every month which was translating into more market share, more business, more revenues. I hope by now I've persuaded you that leaders are made. They're not born. They're made by engaging in principles and practices like performing early miracles, treating everyone with dignity and respect, persevering, doing the jobs that nobody else wants to do, being honest, communicating effectively, training your disciples. What will you, you will see happen is that around your business, you won't tolerate a dirty store. You won't tolerate a display that's unorganized. You won't tolerate a coworker being rude to a customer. In fact, you probably end up being a leader in all facets of your life. You won't tolerate poor schools. You won't tolerate dishonesty. You won't tolerate seeing a person of color being spoken to by another person in a way that's demeaning. You will find that you are compelled in every setting, everywhere you go, to speak up and get involved for freedom and justice and honesty.
And once you do that, your business takes care of itself. And you're a great leader. Thank you very much.